service than with uh, Baptist faith. Amen. Amen. My favorite thing is we celebrate a new life in Christ. Uh, so you be praying for McKinley. I know she will be excited because you have a, a lot, you have a big cheering crowd out here for you. you know? <laughs> All right. So, well, you know, come on down. Let me hold this speak down for you. You can down and stand up on this screen. Kelly Cobb, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and that he rose again on the third day? Yes. <laughs> Amen. Now I, I now baptize you, my little sister, in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 <laughs> All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. good morning. It's great to see everybody out today. Um, let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come to you, Lord, on this beautiful morning, thanking you for this day. Lord, we just thank you for the witnessing of this baptism. Lord, we just uh, lift up to McKinley to you at this time. Um, Lord, we just um, thank you for all the ones that have come out this morning to witness that. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings. Lord, we just ask all this in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's go around, shake hands, and greet one another. Here we go. Praise him.
friend of our church, a good friend of the association. So, all right, well, there's nothing else. Take your hymnals and turn to him 517. I will sing them my reading. Let's sing the first, second, and fourth. <laughs> no more. Let's please stand for taking the reading of the word in the second Acts. Starting here in 38 through 41. Something to do with our baptism this morning. And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized for every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone, whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come again, Lord, thanking you for this day. Lord, thanking you for the witness of this baptism. Lord, we just thank you for the reading of your word this morning. Lord, we just um, look over this prayer concern lift. Lord, we thank you for the ones that we have taken off. Lord, that we, we see that we have... Uh, ones that we have added, Lord, and the ones that are still on, updates, Lord, we just lift them up to you at this time, Lord, for we know your every read, their every need. Lord, we just uh, thank you for all that have come out this morning, Lord. Lord, we ask that you be with our pastor today as he brings the message. We ask all this in your son's name we pray. Amen. Take your hymn with us, with us again. We'll sing hymn 45. Crown him with many crowns. We'll sing the marked verses 1, 3, and 4.
Jesus' name, oh how sweet, oh how earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet, oh how earth and joy of heaven, hope is built on nothing less than blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest friend but only lean on Jesus name Lord Christ of solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand the darkness seems to hide his face my rest on his unchanging grace Just to know, thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry turned our fans on for us and pointed out that the heat was still running off the air. What a time to fix the baptismal heater. I could have used it to be ice cold this morning. Right? <laughs> and Eddie back there laughing at me. I practically ruptured something trying to stop from coming in early because I was ready to come in before it was time to on the, on the song. So. Wow, uh, again, what a beautiful day. You know, as I look out and see everybody, I've, I'm struck with the thought, uh, our, our doctrinal stance prevents this from happening, but McKinley, you need to be baptized every week. Because, uh, I love this crowd. So, <laughs> so it is truly good to see everybody out. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles with me and turn with me into the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John. God, John chapter 20. Uh, great great section of scripture as if you know every section of scripture is great but i like this one this takes place the event that we're going to look at takes place one week after the after the resurrection so just like we're here one week after we celebrated easter sunday so this happened one week since the resurrection if you're familiar with the account you remember that jesus after the resurrection the day he was resurrected he appeared to the disciples. He appeared to at least 10 of the disciples in the upper room. Judas, of course, had already gone out, hung himself. And then there was one guy who wasn't there when Jesus first appeared to him. Poor guy, Thomas. And you make one mistake in your life and you get labeled for the rest of your life. Because this guy, 
has just gotten vilified because one, he wasn't there when uh, that first Resurrection Sunday, and two, because he just voiced his desire for some proof that it actually happened, and he, man, he just, he just. He just bears the weight of so much. I want you to know, I am, and more I just look at this guy, and we don't know a whole lot about Thomas. Scripture doesn't say a whole lot about him, but what we see in there, just as I think about him and look at Thomas, I am Team Thomas. I want to tell you, I am Team Thomas. He is a kindred spirit to me. Uh, one, he wasn't afraid to ask questions. Uh, he wanted some evidence. Nothing wrong with that. And... At the same time, and we often overlook this, Thomas was very devoted and courageous. And I think John liked Thomas too, because the information we have about Thomas, most of what we find out about him only appears in the Gospel of John. So I, th I think John was pretty sympathetic to him too. Three things to point out. One of them we're going to look at here in just a few minutes. The other two things that we know about Thomas, other than he's just being listed with the disciples, in John chapter 11... When Lazarus had died and Jesus was going to go to resurrect, remember he waited for them. And then finally Jesus says, all right, let's go check on Lazarus, whatever. Well, Jesus had already told him that as he makes his way back into Jerusalem and there, you know, that bad stuff happens, that he could die. And Thomas is the one who speaks up. And I don't think he was being pessimistic. I don't think he was being smart aleck or anything like that. Thomas is the one that speaks up and says, let's go with him that we may die there too. And I think he meant just that. I think he, I think he meant, Lord, I'm with you, and I'm ready to die with you, okay? Second thing that we know about Thomas other than this passage is in the 14th chapter of John, when Jesus talks about going to prepare a way for them, and he says, you know where I'm going, and he said, Thomas is the one that speaks up and says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And then, of course, Jesus follows up with that very familiar scripture, I am the way, the truth, and the life. See, but Thomas wasn't afraid to ask a question. He's like, I don't understand, God. It, Jesus explained this to him. And so I like him. I, 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 and I like this interaction with Jesus, too. He gets labeled doubting Thomas. I think there's a lot more going on than just Thomas doubting, okay? And so we're going to look at that. Um, in this interaction that we see between Jesus and Thomas. I think, though brief, I think it teaches us some powerful truths about faith. When I say faith, I mean a saving faith in Jesus Christ. And so look with me in John chapter 20. We're going to be in verse 24. Verse 24 just is kind of the bridge between the two Sundays, Resurrection Sunday and then this week after. Verse 24 says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and he stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands. And reach here in, with your hand and, and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And then Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those, blessed are they who do, did not see and yet believed. What a great interaction between Jesus and Thomas. Again, I point out the Bible says, you know, eight days later, remember the Jewish reckoning of days though, as in any part of the day was a day. And so that's what we know. It says eight days. You might be thinking, well, wouldn't that be Monday? No, it was Sunday. It was the week after. You, uh, and, and poor Thomas, could you imagine putting up with the other disciples for a week going, we seen the Lord. We seen the Lord. Where were you, Thomas? Oh, that's right. You weren't there. Where are you? I think they probably gave him a hard time. Um, but that's just me. So, so but I think it was one of the things that we see, and, and I think we, this, I don't know more than anything, but this certainly needs to jump out at us when we think about this interaction with Thomas. So he told them, the disciples tell him, we've seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord. Now, 
I don't think Thomas had any reason to not believe them, right? Maybe he thought, well, you all are just, just wishful thinking. We don't know exactly what was going on in Thomas' mind. But his answer, he says, unless I see, unless I see. And that should just ring out to us and remind us that faith has to be personal. Faith has to be personal. See, the other guys saw Jesus, all right? And them seeing Jesus didn't really help Thomas out as far as his faith relationship with Jesus, right? And that's important for us to remember. Um, you know, you hear some people say, well, if, you, if you would ask them about their faith, ask them about their belief, ask them about church, and, and they'll follow up with something like, well, you know, yeah, a lot of guys, well, yeah, my, well, my wife goes to church kind of thing. Or, well, my parents, sure, they, they believed all that. And, and you can tell, you can tell there's this unspoken finish to their phrase, which is something like this. Yeah, my wife, my wife believed all that, so I'm covered, right? Or my parents believed that, and, and you know, they raised me going to church, so I'm covered, right? I like to say, you've heard me say it before, I'll say it again and again and again, as long as I have breath to say, there are no family passes into heaven, all right? No family passes into heaven. It does not matter one bit as far as your salvation or my salvation, what somebody else believes. If I don't believe, if I didn't believe in Jesus, Kathy could be the strongest Christian there is, and it would not help me one bit as far as my salvation. I don't care if your parents are godly people. I don't care if your grandparents spent every waking moment in church and did all of this. It does not do you one bit of good as far as your salvation. And so we get that kind of picture from Thomas. Yeah, great, guys. You saw Jesus. I need to see. I need to have this experience with him. I, it needs to be personal. It needs to be personal. Faith has to be personal. You cannot count on somebody else's beliefs to save you. It's only yours and yours alone. You have to figure out, you have to decide, what do I believe about Jesus? Your faith has to be personal for it to be a saving faith. One of the other things, too, we see with Thomas is that faith is experiential. What in the world do I mean by that? Well, again, it kind of is a, it kind of closely tied with this. And this is where it gets, things get a little more difficult. But guess what? Jesus even acknowledges that it's a little more difficult. When he says in verse 29, Thomas, that is great that you believe. You had the, I'm paraphrasing, of course. You have the benefit of seeing me standing right here in front of you. Just think how blessed people are who are going to believe without that benefit. Which includes every single one of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. We did not have the benefit of seeing Jesus physically with our eyes. And yet we believe. But, but, I hope that each one of us can say, I did not physically see Jesus, but I know I had an experience with Jesus. I had an experience, an encounter with Jesus. I know that. We sang last week. It's probably all throughout the world the hymn was saying, you asked me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. That song expressing that idea. I know that Jesus lived because I know Jesus lives within me. His Holy Spirit is in me. We've been talking as we studied in Ephesians uh, that you know the Holy Spirit is given to us as that down payment, as that pledge, as God putting his stamp of ownership on us. It says the Holy Spirit dwells in you, your mind, all right? And so each and every one of us have to have a personal relationship with Christ, but it has to be an, an experience that we have. We often describe it like this. It needs to move from your head to your heart, right? You can, you can acknowledge facts, right? You can, you know, you can acknowledge these things happen, but until it, it kind of really makes an impact in your life and it begins to transform you in, and like Jesus, into like Jesus. And so, you know, you hear about this great and exciting and vibrant relationship that people have with Jesus, and you're going, I, I've never experienced anything like that. 
Now, now listen, experience is in and of itself. I'm not talking about just being caught up in emotions, okay? But experience in themselves. But you say, I, I, my relationship with Christ has never been like that. In fact, when they talk about Jesus, it always feels secondhand to them. Like they're talking about someone they've never actually met before. And we, I think we know the difference. If I'm going to talk to you and tell you about Kathy, Believe me, that's going to be a lot different than, say, if I told you about, you know, George Washington, all right? I may know some facts about George Washington, probably not as many as I should, but I should, I probably, and I could be, tell you things about George Washington, but you, you ought to get, you ought to be able to tell a difference between me talking about George Washington and me talking about my wife for 35 years. You should be able to tell, wow, his relationship with his wife is a lot deeper. You would hope, right? That they're, you know, he actually truly knows her, right? They have a life together. And so that's the way it should be when I talk about our relationship with Christ being experiential. It shouldn't be that we're just, we're just kind of, we know facts and it all feels secondhand and it all feels like we're talking about somebody we don't know. Because we believe that we have met Jesus, right? We believe that we have had an encounter with him. I mean, his Holy Spirit lives within us. It's, I mean, it's an amazing thing. It's one of those things that just boggles my mind every time I think about it. And I've been rereading a great book just simply called Knowing God. And you think about just that, the, that we can know God. It blows my mind. Not fully because we're very limited, right? We're not going to know everything. But then we can know God, not just know about him. He invites us to know him, to be, that's, we talked about this so much over the years. It's about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we see that with Thomas. He's, look, guys, I, that's great that you got to see him, but this is something, one, that I need to do personally, and it's something that I have to experience for myself. That you guys experience seeing the resurrected Christ, again, didn't really do a lot for Thomas as far as a saving faith. I've got to experience this myself. Another thing that we see, and hang with me here as we think about this, is that I believe faith also is reasonable. Let me tell you something. I hate the phrase blind faith. I do not have blind faith. I do not have blind faith in Jesus. I have a very reasoned faith in Jesus. Now, look, does that mean I know everything, understand it all? Gosh, no. <laughs> and, the, you know, the more I do learn, the more I learn I don't know a whole lot, right? I mean, it, it we'll never understand it all, okay? But this idea of blind faith, I, I know. And what we label as doubt, Thomas was just going, I need to see some evidence. I, I just want some proof. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Look, in 1 Corinthians 15, as Paul is teaching about the resurrection, one of the things he does is he goes through and he lists all the people who had seen the resurrected Christ. He appeared to Peter and to James, and he appeared, and then he goes and he appeared to 500 at once, and he adds this little phrase in there, and he says, and most of them, not all, most of them are still alive. Why did he say that? Because he was inviting and encouraging people who had doubts, go talk to them yourself. Go interview him. Go talk to him. Go talk to the people who had seen him. You know, don't just take my word for it. Go investigate. It is so exciting. We see this time and time again. It happened with Lee Strobel. It happened with, now I forget the guy's name. We've been watching. A, he's a police detective. Uh, and he decided, an atheist, and he decided, you know what? I'm going to apply. And he, he specialized in cold cases. Uh, he, he called them nobody murders. Meaning he had to solve a murder, but he didn't have a body, right? So he had to solve a crime. There was no body. That should sound familiar to us, right? And that's what he thought too. He's like, I'm going to take what I've done for the last, I forget how many, 20 years or whatever as a detective, and I'm going to investigate this, what the Bible says. I'm going to find out. He got to go up. And as we see happen time and time again, as people investigate the claims of the Bible, they say, 
it's true, and he's a Christian, he's writing books about it, things like that. Again, Lee Strobel, that's how C.S. Lewis got saved, one of my heroes in the faith. C.S. Lewis, an atheist too, that kind of started out with, I'm gonna prove that this is all false, and come to be a Christian, right? So, another book, I, I'm sorry, but another book I just read not too long ago, great title, this is where I'm gonna, you know, maybe tick a lot of people off uh, if you're watching, Come talk to me if you get mad, okay? The title of the book is I Don't Have the Faith to Be an Atheist, which I think is great. I mean, I think that is, that is so great. Because, listen, I believe that God created the earth in the sixth day like the Bible tells us. Now, I believe God did that because I'm a Christian. If I were not a Christian, I would still believe in intelligent design. Because the idea that all of this just happened I don't care how many billions of years you give it. I don't care how many genetic mutations you give it. The idea that this all just happened and evolved on its own is preposterous to me. I am not an evolutionist because I consider myself a rational and logical being. Now, some of you might want to throw hymnals at me. I understand that, and somebody might be watching later. Drive by our house and throw hymnals at me, whatever. But I'm just telling you, Look, there's a lot of things that are religions that people don't consider religions, and, and humanism and evolution is a religion. And the faith that it requires to believe that, I think that stretches credibility to me, all right? So this idea of, you know, all Christians are anti-scientific and Christians are anti-intellectual. You know, when non-believers make those claims, it's offensive to me. When believers express those kind of attitudes, it's embarrassing to me, okay? Because we do not have an anti-intellectual faith. I believe our faith is very reasoned, and if you want to explore it, I think you'll find the same thing that other people have, that it makes sense. I'm a Christian. I believe what this word says because it best, in my mind, conforms and explains reality, all right? And in, in the way in which we live. We're not gonna know everything. We're not gonna understand it all. But we should be able to tell people why we believe what we believe. And this is my humble opinion, it should be more than just because that's what I was taught. We should be able to un understand why I believe this. Why does this make sense to me? What is the big picture of scripture that kind of ties it all together? The Bible says we should be able to give a defense of our faith, not be on the defensive, but to be able to explain why we believe what we believe. And so Thomas looking at those guys and, and, and in essence saying to Christ, although Jesus wasn't there at the time, look, I just want a little bit of evidence. I just want some proof. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I don't think that's contrary to faith. I believe we have a very reasoned faith, very logical faith. And you can disagree with me on that. That's okay. I don't mind if you're wrong. But Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you got me. Yeah. <laughs> My daughter. I knew she'd get it. <laughs> but I want to, I mean, we don't, look, and it's not every, somebody, that, that that's their ministry. That, yeah, they, they have a ministry of being able to answer those tough questions. And they have a ministry to be able to, and to, argue not being argumentative but to argue those things and they i mean and that's not everybody's thing i get that okay i get that but do not be afraid and don't shy away when people start asking questions all right we should be able to answer those questions don't buy into them when somebody comes up and talks about oh you know to have faith you have to turn your brain off it's just simply not true all right there are some things we have to accept by faith. We're not going to have the proof of them. But there is much that we believe that is supported by historical evidence. And Thomas looking for that, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And lastly, and then again, I would say this, this is on par with the first one as far as being so important, is that our faith has to be factual. Again, what do I mean by that? If Jesus would have showed up and Thomas would have saw him and said, ah, my enlightened and loving teacher, 
I think he'd been in big trouble, right? I've said this before. You, you, you talk to people and say, do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yes, I believe in Jesus. Don't stop there. Don't stop there. Because people believe all kinds of things about Jesus, and they just aren't true. So when we say you have to believe in Jesus, it's not believe whatever you want about Jesus, okay? And now I believe in Jesus, and then you, know, you talk to them and they say, well, that's just, you know, anytime somebody throws out, well, that's just what I believe, when you maybe counter with, say, Scripture, and they go, oh, that's just what I believe. Look, believing something wrong is not going to help us. And, and I know we live in a time, we live in a day, and we live in an age where everybody's belief system is equally valid and everybody's beliefs are on par and everybody's beliefs are right for them. But I'm sorry, folks, that's not what Scripture teaches. You can believe wrong. And you can believe wrong all the while going, sure, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he was a good teacher. I believe he was an enlightened person. I believe that he was a great man. Those kind of things. Well, you believe this Jesus existed, but you don't believe in Jesus. Not in the Jesus in Scripture. Again, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul starts out talking about the resurrection going, you know, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And then what does he say? According to the Scripture. And that he was buried and rose again on the third day, according to the scripture. According to the scripture. Again, saving faith is not believing whatever you want to believe about Jesus. Saving faith is believing that Jesus is who he said that he is, and that he did what he said he did. And all of that is according to what is revealed to us in the Bible. Period. All of this from Thomas. So, to, yeah. Thomas came to the conclusion, the right conclusion, by the way, of my Lord and my God, which is one of the most, and I know Peter gets credit for his, his confession of faith, which was awesome, you know, but Thomas, my Lord and my God. People read the scripture, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, which is false. You, don't, you haven't read the New Testament if you come away with that. And that, you know, the, the, the disciples added this later on that, but Thomas, he, maybe he got it right. He says right off the bat, you're God. You're God. So he got his identity correct. Jesus, you're God. But he also got his authority correct too. And you're my Lord. You're my Lord. You're the boss, right? You're in charge. My Lord and my God. And all of this, just through this encounter that Thomas had with him, he gets such a bad rap. God love him. He gets such a bad rap. You know, we don't we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us about what happens to most of the disciples. Uh, church history uh, fills in those blanks, and, and I you know I get it. Church history may not be on par with Scripture, but I you know, like we've heard other things. According to church history, Thomas goes into India uh, to evangelize in India. He eventually gets speared to death. Uh, all of the disciples except the John were martyred. They died for their faith. My Lord and my God. And so I want us to, I just want you to remember that as we think about what does it mean to have faith in Jesus Christ? What does that mean? Well, it means it has to be a personal faith. It has to be something that you have, not somebody you know has, not a loved one, not a spouse, not a parent, not anybody else. You have to have faith faith in Jesus Christ. It's a faith that has to be experienced. It's not just something that you know information about, that you have had an experience with the resurrected Savior. No, you didn't get to see him with your eyes, but you know that you know that you know because you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. It's a faith that's reasonable. You don't check your brain at the door to become a Christian, all right? We have a very reasoned faith. It makes sense when you think about it. And it's a faith that has to deal in facts, in how God revealed himself, how Christ revealed himself through scripture. You don't get just to pick whatever you want to believe about Jesus and say, I have a saving faith in Jesus. A saving faith in Jesus is a Jesus as he has revealed himself in scripture. And hopefully as you go through that, We'll end up, and every one of us have, and our will end up at the same place that Thomas ended up, 
to be able to say, my Lord and my God, and worship him and worship him. <clears throat> Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. What an incredible day. What a beautiful day that you've given to us, Lord. Just a, an exciting day that we get to celebrate McKinley's baptism. Not a day that we get to just worship you. And Father, I just pray that, that we can say, as the Bible says, and we hopefully we'll be able to say every Sunday, that it has been good to be in the Father's house. Good to be in the house of God. Lord, I just pray, God, that as your word, we read your word, Father, and we see in Thomas's life just how important it is that we understand what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ. In our prayers, we come together the way we come together every Sunday. Lord, if there's somebody here or somebody who might be watching later that does not know Jesus Christ personally as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day, God, that they would be able to say, like Thomas, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my God. Father, that your Holy Spirit would just speak to us and Father, that each of us and every one of us would be drawn closer to you. Lord, we just thank you so much for the opportunities that you give us time and time and time again. Lord, that you, you the invitation to come unto you, all who are weary and heavy laden, and you present us with that invitation again and again and again. My prayer, God, is that everybody here, Lord, has said yes to that invitation or Lord, they won't leave today without having said yes to that invitation. So God, we give this time to you. We ask that you would speak to us. Lord, we'd ask that you would help us to step out, to respond in faith. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We, uh, we finish up our service every time with a time of invitation, and it's just simply that. It's, an, it's, a, it's a time that God is inviting us to respond to his word. And so you're here this morning, and maybe you realize, you know what? Boy, that, you know, I think he was describing me. Uh, you know, I can tell you stuff about Jesus, but I can't say that I know him personally. But I, I want to believe that today. I believe that today. In our tradition, in our church, we just would ask if you want to make a decision for Christ that you just step out and come forward. Because we want to share that. All right? Just like, just like Pim, McKinley's public confession of being baptized, to share publicly, this is what Jesus is doing in my life. I believe in Jesus. Something on your heart, maybe you just need to come to the altar and pray. I'd be happy to pray with you. But if there is a decision that you want to make for Christ, especially a decision that you know, that you know, that you know, that Jesus is your Lord and your God. And you want to celebrate that?